thank you so much for the um, only slightly hyperbolic introduction. <laughs> I can't possibly live up to that. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today and to have the opportunity to give the Osiroff Lecture in Photomedicine. As Bruce mentioned, I met Alan when I was a graduate student at MIT. And when I arrived at MIT in 1986, one of the things that I was given was this wonderful book called How to Gamut, How to Get Around MIT. And it was filled with all sorts of useful information about um, how to survive at MIT. And I, I knew I was in a bit over my head when I looked at the picture on the back cover of the book. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that for me, especially those first couple of years, MIT was a really intimidating place. Um, one of the things that we, we did in our lab was every week we would go over to the Wellman Labs for the photomedicine seminar, and that's how I got to know Alan. And um, we'd have an opportunity to talk about science, talk about the work of the speakers, and um, the thing um, that was really particularly meaningful for me was that he was really the first person outside of my lab who took me seriously as a scientist. And it might seem like a small thing, but for me it came at a particularly um, critical point in my career. And it really made a huge difference in helping me believe that I was a scientist and that I could go on to have a, a professional future in this area. And I think it's important for all of us to remember that there's always somebody coming behind you who sees you as that role model and to pay it forward and, and really help them see themselves as the next generation of, of scientists. So I want to talk today about um, some of the road that we've traveled since those early days at MIT. And I'm going to take a bit of a non-photomedicine detour and tell you about some work that we're doing in global health. And I promise I'll come back to photomedicine um, because it's one of the ways that we became, we became interested and how we could apply the, the potential of photomedicine to improve health in the very lowest resource settings. One of the things that I learned as a student at MIT was how to think about the design of new health technologies to address unmet clinical needs. But I wasn't taught to explicitly think about who might have access to those technologies. We were really taking a, a perspective that was focused on the environment in which we were working, the problems of high resource settings. And I think, you know, when many of us think about what are the, the things that motivate us to try and develop new technologies, it's because we want our children's generation to have better health care than we have. We would like to imagine that they could be the first cancer-free generation, for example. But if you think about where most children in the world live, they don't live in wealthy countries. 90% of the children in the world live in developing countries. And half of them live on less than $2 a day. And the health challenges that these children face are really enormous. If you look at a girl born in Chad today, she's only 10% more likely to learn to read than she is to die before her fifth birthday. This is not typically the kind of challenge that we're thinking about in designing new health technologies. And you know, if, we look at, um, if we look at where technologies are being developed for, approximately 90% of the R&D budget globally for the development of new health technologies is focused on health challenges that affect 10% of the world's population. This is known as the 1090 gap. And if you think about why that exists, all I have to do is look out the window of my building. We're right across the street from the Texas Medical Center. And there is huge economic incentive to develop technologies to continue to make healthcare better in this setting. There is a huge infrastructure to support the development of technologies in this setting. There are delivery systems to get the technologies and the consumables there. There is so much support for these technologies that is just absent in the settings where most people in the world get their health care. What are the economic incentives for this setting? There's no one to pay for technologies. 
There's no delivery system to bring consumables to this kind of setting. And even if you get technologies there, there's very little infrastructure to support their use. There's limited and inadequate supply of electricity, limited and inadequate supply of clean water. This is a photo of a lab at a health center in the DRC. And you can see in this lab, they basically have two pieces of technology. They have a light microscope, which is sitting next to the window because there's no electricity in this clinic, so the sun is the light source for the microscope, and they have a hand crank centrifuge. And that's the only technology that's available in this setting. And it's not hard to understand why companies aren't beating down the door of this clinic trying to develop technologies because there's very little um, economic return on that type of investment if we think about current business models. So when I moved to Rice, I became very interested in thinking about how, as a community, biomedical engineers could work together to reimagine the development of healthcare technologies in a way that all of the world's population would have access to those technologies. And we decided to approach this problem from um, uh, maybe a, a somewhat um, unlikely perspective. And that was from the perspective of undergraduate education. At the time that we were doing this, we were also thinking about what we should do with our senior design course in biomedical engineering. And we really wanted to have our students work on real challenges and, and try and design technologies to solve real problems. And we met colleagues in the medical center who were trying to implement pediatric AIDS care in southern Africa. And so we worked with those colleagues and, and their colleagues in country to identify what were the unmet health needs in this setting and tried to turn those into design challenges that teams of undergraduates would be capable of solving. These teams of students were mentored by healthcare providers who had experience working in these settings or were actually working in these settings. And then when they came up with successful designs, we provided travel funds to send them to the setting that originated the challenge so that they could take their prototype and get feedback on their prototype and in certain cases actually implement their prototype under appropriate IRB approval. And so I want to share with you um, a couple of results from those student projects. And the first one I want to share with you is actually a very simple technology. And this actually um, was solved by a team of freshman students. It was originally assigned to a team of senior design students, and they actually came up with a solution that was far too technically complicated and everyone hated. <laughs> the problem was the following. At this time, children who were HIV positive were receiving liquid ARVs. There weren't fixed dose combination pills that were available in appropriate dosages for children at that time. So they had to take liquid medication. And often these children were being cared for by um, their grandparents or other relatives who might have limited visual acuity and limited numeracy skills. So the um, physicians were very worried that the children were not receiving the proper dose of liquid ARVs. And so they wanted a simple and inexpensive technology to help ensure that the kids would receive the proper dose of medicine. And so this team of freshmen came up with a great idea. This is their um, drawing of their initial idea. And the idea was to take a oral dosing syringe and just design a little plastic clip that you could put inside the barrel of the syringe that would limit the amount that you could pull the plunger back so you couldn't overdose the amount of medicine. And they worked in our design studio to use a 3D printer to go through several rounds of um, producing a part, testing it, refining it so that it would deliver the correct dose. And what they showed under laboratory conditions was that these clips were actually accurate to within seven microliters of the intended dose. It was pretty remarkable. They worked at a health fair at our local YMCA to test the impact that the clips had on dosing accuracy. And they showed that they were able to improve the fraction of um, of participants who could give a correct dose of medicine from around 20% with a dosing cup to over 90% with the dosing clip. The student that I showed you in that photo in Swaziland, Ben Liu, took these clips um, to Swaziland where he was able to demonstrate them for the head pharmacist. 
And at this time in Swaziland, they were scaling up the program to prevent the transmission of HIV from mother to child. And that involved giving babies doses of liquid medicine during the entire time from birth throughout the entire time they were being breastfed. So there was huge concern that moms might not be able to give the correct dose, which would change as the baby um, got bigger. And so um, Ben called us up from Swaziland. We had a Skype call with him. And he said, I have good news for you. The Clinton Health Access Initiative would like to purchase uh, 23,000 clips for the national scale up of the PMTCT program. Now, at that time, we were 3D printing the clips in our uh, design studio. We were using Sharpies to hand color them because they're color coded by dose. And we thought, how are we ever going to make 20,000 of these clips? So we worked with a company in the Bay Area called Third Stone Design that um, helped us work with the firm in, in China to injection mold the clips. And we were able, just a couple of months later, to deliver the first year's worth of clips. And since then, we've delivered another year's worth of clips to the PMTCT program. And Ben and his colleagues that helped design the clips were honored at the CGI University meeting two years ago for their work to do this. So this is an example of an extremely simple technology. It's hard to imagine a simpler technology than this. And we wanted to explore whether this model could be used to take on more um, complicated clinical challenges. And we partnered with a really amazing pediatrician named Liz Molyneux, who's been working in Malawi since the early 1970s. Um, we had a chance to visit Dr. Molyneux's uh, hospital. She works at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre. And this is a photo that's quite typical of what you see when you go to the neonatal ward at QECH. It's not uncommon to find four babies sharing a cot. Malawi has a 18% uh, rate of preterm birth. 18% of babies are born too soon. It's the highest rate of preterm birth in the world. Half of babies who are born prematurely struggle to breathe because their lungs lack surfactant. And it's really, it's just heartbreaking to watch these babies try and breathe because every time they exhale, their alveoli are collapsing because they lack surfactant. And so, so much of their energy goes into breathing and eventually they just get tired and they wear out. Now, in, in Malawi, the standard of care to treat what's called respiratory distress syndrome in premature babies is nasal oxygen. And there was a wonderful review article that was written, um, it came out two years ago, in pediatrics that looked at historical changes in the survival of premature babies that suffered from respiratory distress syndrome as new technologies were developed. And so um, before oxygen was available, this was essentially a, a fatal disorder. But when nasal oxygen became available, that was the standard of care in the 1950s in the United States, the survival rate went from 0 to 25%. And that's where we are today in Malawi. In the 1970s, there was a technology that was developed called CPAP, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. CPAP is really a pretty simple idea. So you use a set of silicone rubber nasal prongs and you just blow in a mix of pressurized air and oxygen gently into the baby's nostrils. And what that does is it prevents alveolar collapse. And it greatly reduces the work of breathing for these babies so that they're able to get adequate oxygen until they start producing surfactant. And when CPAP was introduced in the United States, the survival rate for babies with RDS went from 25% to 70%. Today we're able to deliver surfactant and survival rates have improved further. So Dr. Molyneux challenged our program to develop an effective and affordable bubble CPAP machine that can be used in her clinic. CPAP machines are available at $6,000. They're, they're just too expensive um, to be available in the Malawian health system. And so in 2010, we tasked a team of senior design students with designing an affordable and effective bubble CPAP system. And here you can see the team of students with the result of their project. This is Jocelyn Brown, one of the um, inventors of this technology. And I'll tell you more about Jocelyn's involvement in the project. But you can see the result of it looks very much like a student project. This is a plastic shoe box that they bought at Target. This is a Nalgene water bottle that they bought at a sporting goods store. 
And what they did, the ingenious idea that they had was to go to the pet store and buy two aquarium pumps. And those aquarium pumps serve as the flow driver in this bubble CPAP device. They're able to include oxygen from an oxygen concentrator and then use standard flow regulators to um, blend oxygen and air and adjust the total flow that the baby receives. The water bottle essentially serves as a pressure relief valve so that you don't apply too much pressure uh, to the baby's respiratory tract. And Jocelyn and her teammates took this device over to Texas Children's Hospital and they tested the flow and pressure that their system delivered and they compared it directly to the Fisher and PayCal system that is used to treat babies at Texas Children's Hospital. And what they found was that across a broad range of flows and pressures, the systems performed essentially identically. So at that point, we sent Jocelyn to Malawi, and she was able to demonstrate her device for the nurses and physicians at QECH. And you can see here she's showing the nurses the device. The nurses had many, many suggestions for her. They told her it was too hard to use, that it wasn't sufficiently robust. She came back to Houston, and she wrote a grant to a wonderful organization called NCIIA, National Collegiate Inventors and Innovators Alliance. So she got a little grant from NCIIA, and she was able to work with an industrial design firm to make the device more robust and more usable. So now all of these connectors are polarized, so you can't plug the wrong connector into the wrong socket, and it's much more robust. But what's inside is identical to what was inside that little plastic shoebox that I showed you. And with that, we were able to write a grant to USAID. And USAID gave us a one-year grant to carry out a clinical evaluation of what the impact of this device was on the survival for preterm babies in Malawi at, at this particular NICU. This is Dr. Molyneux. Here's Jocelyn, who was able to take the device, participating in the training of the CPAP nurses, who worked over the course of a year to um, compare the survival for babies who received either nasal oxygen or bubble CPAP. This is one of the first babies that received bubble CPAP at QECH. And what we found at the conclusion of the trial, this is the historical data from the United States. What we found in our study was that for babies who received nasal oxygen, their survival rate was around 24%. In contrast, babies who received CPAP, their survival rate was 65%, almost exactly what was found when CPAP was introduced in the United States. With that, that data in hand, we were able to write a follow-on grant to USAID to allow us now to implement CPAP at all government hospitals in Malawi. So with our seed grant, we were able to show that the equipment is robust and helpful at the largest teaching hospital in Malawi. We've now rolled out to the other three central hospitals and four affiliated district hospitals, and we're just going into the next 10 hospitals, and then a year from now, we'll go into 10 more hospitals. Jocelyn has been working in Malawi for the last two years to help um, perform all of the training and the rollout of the CPAP device. And this is a photo that was taken at Machinga District Hospital, which is one of the first district hospitals that we went to. And it was taken right after the training. So after the training happened, one of the nurses came up to Jocelyn and, and Norman, our colleague from the Ministry of Health, and she said, I am so excited to see CPAP coming here. And it turned out that six months ago, she had a baby boy, and her son was born prematurely. So much so that he had extreme breathing difficulties, and he was transferred from Machinga to Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, where he actually was a participant and received CPAP in the clinical study. And we said to her, we would love to meet your son. And she said, he's just across the street. I'm going to run home and get him. And so she brought her son, and we all had a chance to meet him. And it was such a great opportunity to celebrate the real success of CPAP in Malawi. What we're doing now is we're producing devices in partnership with our commercial partner, Third Stone Design. So these are the devices that are being made actually in, in San Francisco um, and then being shipped to Malawi to be rolled out. Our goal is to put these devices first at all the hospitals in Malawi, then to expand to the SADC region, and finally, to put them everywhere that babies need help breathing. I got an email um, a couple of weeks ago um, that I wanted to share with you um, about the CPAP project. 
this was an email that um, came to me from a pediatrician who was working in Jamaica. And she said, um, I recently finished my pediat pediatric residency in the United States, and I returned home to Jamaica, and I'm working in one of our local NICUs. She wrote that we have many shortcomings, mostly due to lack of funding, but we're not foreign to the idea of CPAP. I was searching online to buy a used CPAP machine, and I stumbled across a report on your CPAP in Malawi. Can we purchase it here in Jamaica? I spent an hour yesterday writing up death certificates. The reason that I wrote only for an hour is that I ran out of certificates. There are still over 50 charts sitting there waiting. I'm convinced that CPAP could have helped some of these babies and that some of my babies who are currently struggling could be gaining weight and getting better if we had CPAP. Thank you for all the work you've done so that institutions like mine can benefit because if the only option we have is to buy an expensive Fisher & Pay Cal CPAP, I guarantee I will just end up having to fill out a bunch more death certificates. Anyway, I will pray for a good reply. I figure based on the price, I can save up to purchase one machine every two months. My babies deserve to live just as any other. I think we can't continue to let this situation uh, exist when we have the opportunity to help, when the means for help is within our grasp. What we're trying to do at Rice today now is to think about comprehensively what are the needs, the technology needs, to help newborns survive the first and the most dangerous days of their lives. What do they need to keep them warm, to keep them hydrated, to make sure that their glucose levels are appropriate, to be able to determine if they have an infection, if it's bacterial or viral, and treat it appropriately. We estimate that a comprehensive set of affordable technologies could be developed for a district hospital that serves a catchment area of 300,000 people for on the order of $5,000. It's less than the cost of one Western-style CPAP machine. And this is our goal over the next five years. Um, I recognize that this is an optimistic goal. And I recently had the opportunity to meet one of my heroes in global health, Bill Fagey. And um, if you read the wonderful book that was written about his efforts to eradicate smallpox, there's a great quote about the need for optimism. He said, you know, the trouble with being an optimist is, of course, that people think you don't know what's going on, but it's the way to live. There's a place for cynicism, there's a place for pessimism, but you don't want those people on your team. You have to be an optimist. And so our goal is to develop what we call the nursery of the future. Um, and the first implementation site for this will be at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. And we were able to use crowdfunding to actually raise um, a significant amount of, of resources to completely renovate the neonatal unit at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. And it will um, then serve as an innovation hub to help us continue to develop, refine, and implement these types of technologies. And I show this photo. Um, it looks a little messy, but it's something that we're really proud of. There's a little baby inside this incubator. This is an incubator that's made of wood. And there are four light bulbs underneath the incubator that warm the air. And you can control the temperature by turning the light bulbs on and off. This is known fondly as the Malawi hot cot. And this is an African-designed incubator built in Africa for African children. Sitting on top of this incubator, this baby has neonatal jaundice. This is a set of phototherapy lights that uses blue LEDs to deliver the phototherapy dose. And this is something that was designed as a student design project in our Beyond Traditional Borders project. The design then was transferred to Malawi Polytechnic. The Polytechnic College is essentially a, a community college um, technical school that's across the street from Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. And so these lights are now being manufactured locally in Malawi. And this baby is also receiving CPAP with the Pumani CPAP device that was designed in our program, built now in San Francisco but um, with the plans to scale up to multinational manufacturing and distribution. So I'm optimistic that it's possible. So um, in, in the second part of my talk, I want to come back um, more to um, more, more traditional um, biomedical optics topics. 
And I want to talk about cancer, but in the, in the global context. There was a great review article that appeared a few years ago that highlights um, why can t cancer is really an emerging challenge for low resource settings. If you look at the total number of global deaths due to cancer, it's greater actually than the sum of deaths due to TB, HIV, and malaria. And if we look at where increases in the incidence of cancer are projected to occur, the vast majority of the, of the increase will occur in low resource settings. And these are the settings that have the least ability to deal with the challenges of cancer. So on one of my trips to Malawi, um, I was visiting a hospital called St. Gabriel's Hospital, which is a very, it's an amazing place. It's really a standard bearer for the region. It's run by a Carmelite order of nuns that are some of the strongest women I've ever met. And um, I, I was talking with Alex Nglande, who runs the community health outreach program at St. Gabriel's Hospital. And my lab's had a longstanding interest in cervical cancer. And so I said to Alex, you know, we're really interested in trying to improve early diagnosis of cervical cancer. I know cervical cancer is a big challenge in Africa. We'd love to partner with you around the idea of helping to improve clinical care for cervical cancer patients. Tell me what your needs are. And you know, I, I said this with the expectation that he would talk about the importance of early detection. And what he said to me was, he reached in his desk and he pulled out this bottle and he said, we have many problems with cervical cancer here. He said, we have women who are at home dying of cervical cancer and the big challenge that we face is how to provide them with an adequate dosage of liquid morphine. So we give their families these bottles and we give them the dosing cups, but we worry that they don't get the proper dosage of morphine so that their pain is not managed adequately. And it would be awesome if you could help us improve the accuracy of dosing liquid morphine. And I just, you know, I, it was hard to um, process that answer. Um, and, and so, of course, we did work with him to try and improve the dosing of morphine. We developed a version of the clip that could be used with the dosing with the bottles that they provide uh, morphine in. And we had students work with their team to help them develop an open records database that could be used to track patients who are being cared for in their palliative care program. But it just reinforces the, the message that right now, when you go to Africa and you look at cancer, we're talking about palliation. And we should be talking about prevention particularly with cervical cancer where we have technology to identify it early and, and prevent it. If we look at the five-year survival rates for many types of epithelial cancer, cervix, oral, esophagus, the five-year survival rates are much lower if cancer is diagnosed at a stage where there's distant metastasis rather than if it's diagnosed at a stage where it's still confined to the local organ site. And we miss so many opportunities to intervene with the population that is at highest risk in Africa, and that's women who are HIV positive. It's a photo that was taken at an HIV clinic in Swaziland, and so these are women who are coming in to get their ARVs. You can see there's all these health posters on the back wall, and this is one of the posters on the back wall. It says, attention women attending an HIV ARV clinic, have you had a pap smear in the last year? And it goes on to explain the importance of doing that. So I asked the nurse at the clinic, you know, how many pap smears did you perform in the last year? And the answer was zero, because this is a clinic that didn't have running water. Um, they didn't have the resources to take smears. They didn't have cytotechnicians to read smears. The infrastructure to do screening just did not exist. Now, many people have recognized this challenge, and, and one of the ways that it's being approached is with a technology called visual inspection with acetic acid, or VIA. And in VIA, what you do is a woman comes in for a pelvic exam, you use a speculum to visualize the cervix, and you apply acetic acid to the cervix. And areas that contain precancerous lesions will turn white. In addition, a lot of other benign areas will turn white as well. 
But in VIA, what happens is if there's a lesion that turns white with acetic acid, women are treated immediately with either cryotherapy or um, loop electrosurgical excision procedures. And um, because VIA has high sensitivity, it does a good job, actually, in helping to prevent the development of cervical cancer. But because it has poor specificity, what happens is about half of women who are treated actually didn't need to be treated because the lesion was just benign. And this is a good example of an acetal-white lesion that was biopsied, and it was histologically normal. So this woman would have been treated unnecessarily. And you know, the treatment is, it is um, relatively safe and well-tolerated, but it also limits the extent to which your resources go. If half the women that you're treating don't need to be treated, if you could figure out who those women are, you could then save that money and use it to expand access to screening to a greater fraction of the population. And this was a, a large series of data that was published looking at the accuracy of VIA. Here's the sensitivity, here's the specificity. You can see that the specificity of VIA is quite poor. It doesn't really matter who's doing the study. It varies a little bit, but it's always lower than you would like it to be. So if we think about what we're looking for as the diagnostic hallmark of cervical precancer, essentially what we're looking for is we're looking for the pleomorphic changes that occur in cell nuclei. We're looking for the enlargement of nuclei, um, the pleomorphic shapes, and um, the um, hyper uh, uh, staining with uh, hematoxylin. So we theorize that if we don't have the infrastructure to take a cytology smear or take a biopsy, perhaps you could do in vivo microscopy and get the same information right at the point of care and use that to help you improve the specificity of making a decision of whether or not to treat. And so we developed what we call a high-resolution microendoscope. It's essentially a fiber optic fluorescence microscope. And you can see here, this is um, about a 9 by 12 inch little box. It's about 2 inches high. Runs on a laptop battery. There's a $10 blue LED. That's the light source. There's a color video rate CCD camera. That's the detector. And it's coupled to a fiber optic probe. We can use probes of varying diameters, ranging from about 400 microns up to 2 millimeters. Small enough to go through the biopsy channel of an endoscope, easily can go through a speculum and be placed in contact with the cervix. And when you place this in contact with epithelial tissue, here what we're doing is we're looking at a field of view of about 720 microns. We apply topically a, um, an antiseptic that also happens to stain DNA, and it's fluorescent, and so we're able to visualize the nuclei with this very inexpensive topical antiseptic, it's called proflavin. We put less than a penny's worth of proflavin on. We're able to image immediately after we apply the proflavin. And we can see the nuclei. This is an example of a normal epithelium. And here is our case of our VIA positive lesion that was histologically normal. And when we look at our high resolution image, we see that the nuclei are small, they're evenly spaced, they're not enlarged classically what we see in normal tissue. So we took this device to two settings to evaluate its ability to identify cervical precancer. We went to China and we went to Botswana. And I'll show you the data from China. In China, um, we piggybacked on a larger study that the NCI was doing to look at 2,500 women who were asymptomatic women being screened. They had VIA. Anyone who was VIA positive came into our study where we were able to do high resolution imaging and then we also randomly pulled a group of 100 women who were VIA negative and did high resolution imaging on them. We biopsied all of the sites that were examined and we were able to compare the results of the high resolution imaging to the biopsy. And here are copo photographs. Um, a patient is a row here. So here's a lesion in a patient. Here's our probe on the lesion. Here's our high resolution image. The biopsy in this came, case came back normal. In contrast, here's another lesion, the probe on the lesion, and you can see how much more enlarged and crowded the nuclei are, and this actually came back as a high-grade precancer. And so what we did was we wrote software to um, automatically segment the nuclei and calculate the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, and what we were able to show is that for high-grade precancer and cancer, there was a significant elevation in the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, a single parameter was able to give us um, a really good discrimination between our high-grade precancers 
and our normal and benign findings. And what we found is that if we had only used the result of the high resolution imaging, we would not have missed any high grade precancers or cancers, and we would have reduced by over 50% the number of unnecessary biopsies. And so you could have had a much more efficient see and treat program using this technology as a guidance. We're now working to um, reduce the cost and improve the usability of the system. So we've got a tablet-based version of the system. You can see it's a lot smaller. And we've got a cell phone-based version of the system here, which we're hoping to take to El Salvador and test in a much larger group of 5,000 women as part of the scale-up that they are doing, um, looking at both VIA and HPV DNA testing in El Salvador. We've tested the system in a variety of other organ sites. We've looked in the esophagus, the oral mucosa, the colon. And I just want to show you very quickly some results from our trial in the esophagus. This was another study that was done in China. And here what we were doing was we were comparing the ability of our $2,000 high resolution microendoscope to a $500,000 confocal microendoscope that is made by Pentax. And we were comparing that to the standard of care which is Lugol's chromoendoscopy. And like VIA, Lugol's endoscopy has high sensitivity, but it has terrible specificity. And so um, we did a study of 130 patients across three sites using this approach. And we found that with Lugol's, the standard of care, great sensitivity, terrible specificity. If we add in our high resolution microendoscope, our sensitivity still remains high, but our specificity comes way up. Targeting biopsies based on endoscopy alone would have resulted in 600 biopsies in the study if we included the high resolution imaging in making the decision of whether or not to biopsy, we would have reduced the number of biopsies to on the order of 100. So a very significant reduction in biopsies. And that's often a huge driver of whether or not a technology is feasible in a low resource setting. In Malawi, in the entire country of 15 million people, there's two pathologists. So they do everything. They do autopsies. You know, they, um, they do everything. And so their ability to read biopsies for cancer screening is extremely limited. So I just want to uh, wrap up by um, talking about um, some of our newer efforts to shift diagnosis closer to the point of care. And the approach here that we're taking is to try and leverage some of the advantages of microfabricated optical technologies that are found in consumer electronics, that are found in the cell phone that everyone in this room has. Um, and and we, we were motivated by a really simple test, and that was the ability to determine whether or not pregnant women or children are anemic. It's a really basic piece of information, and it's really hard to get this information in the teaching hospitals in many African countries. There is a device called HEMA-Q, which you might be familiar with, which is often used in the point of care in the United States. HEMA-Q, this is a picture of it, it's a little $700 reader that measures the transmission of um, capillary blood you obtain from a finger prick, goes into this little cuvette. You measure the transmission at several wavelengths, you calculate quite accurately the hemoglobin concentration. And the challenge is that these cuvettes, the US price is $2, the Malawi price is $1. Nobody in Malawi can afford a dollar to do a hemoglobin test. And so there's plenty of readers that have been donated. And as soon as the box of cuvettes is emptied, the reader goes up on the shelf and it's never used again. So we hypothesized that instead of this little plastic cuvette, we could use a, spot, a, a piece of filter paper and that you could drop a spot of blood on a piece of filter paper and measure the transmission through that piece of filter paper and calculate the hemoglobin concentration. And it turns out, um, here's the reader that we've developed, it turns out that actually um, it's the measuring the transmission in this way is sufficiently accurate to allow you to calculate the concentration of hemoglobin. So this is the agreement between the true hemoglobin concentration and the result of our transmission measurement using this filter paper cuvette. These little filter paper cuvettes can be made for less than a penny. The reader can be made for on the order of $10. And using the same fabricated optics result, I've worked together with my colleague Tomas Tkaczyk to build actually very high resolution fluorescence microscopes that can be used to read out um, bead-based nucleic acid assays. So 
Some of you may be familiar with the Luminex MagPix system that reads out the results of nucleic acid assays. It's about a $35,000 piece of equipment. We can use the same technology approach and duplicate the performance of the, the MagPix system in a much less expensive package. And we're interested in using this concept of paper-based diagnostics to help us move nucleic acid testing closer to the point of care. And what we've tried to do is um, develop a paper-based system for doing isothermal amplification of DNA and then develop lateral flow readout strips to read out whether or not our target is present. We're using an isothermal amplification technique called recombinase polymerase amplification, RPA. It was developed by a company called Twist Diagnostics. And it has a lot of advantages. It works over a broad range of temperatures. You can get about 10 to the 9-fold amplification in about 10 minutes. And it's very tolerant to impurities that remain in your sample. And so we were interested in this for a couple of reasons. The products that are produced by RPA are double-stranded products that are labeled on one end with um, biotin and on the other end with a fluorescent dye. And so you can functionalize a lateral flow strip with streptavidin to capture your amplicon and then come in with an anti-fitzy labeled gold so that you get the purple line just like you get on a lateral flow pregnancy test if your amplicon is present. We were interested in this for doing early infant diagnostics for HIV because babies have circulating maternal antibodies, the antibody-based tests that are used for adults don't work for babies. You need to look to see whether or not there's proviral DNA present in the blood. And so we showed using RPA and lateral flow detection that we could detect um, as few as 10 copies of target that were present in whole blood. But um, we wanted to do that in a paper-based device. So we investigated a variety of different matrices to determine whether or not we could actually carry out RPA in these matrices. And what we found was that in a glass fiber matrix, we actually got excellent production of the product that we saw um, in solution. Here's our positive control solution results. And so uh, a student in my lab, Brittany Rohrman, developed a really um, clever little paper and plastic device that allows you to do this isothermal amplification right at the point of care. And so um, the device uses um, basically clear acetate and double stick tape together with cellulose and our glass fiber pad. And the way it works is the following. You take a, lyophilized, a pellet that contains the lyophilized enzyme for the RPA reaction, and you place it on the sticky adhesive on your acetate. Then you add a wicking strip that has a, a, a cellulose component that is sized so that it will absorb 10 microliters of your sample. Then um, you apply a pad to contain the master mix for your reagent and your glass fiber pad to contain the magnesium acetate that's necessary to initiate the reaction. Add your master mix, add your mass magnesium acetate, dip your wick into your sample to absorb the sample, fold the wick in, close the device up, put it on a little heater. You can even use body temperature because the reaction works from 25 to 42 degrees C. 15 minutes later, pull it apart and run the results on your lateral flow strip. And we're able to get similar level of sensitivity as we can in a solution-based reaction. So there's a long road ahead to get these technologies to actual clinical uh, application. But I am very optimistic that if we develop the right partnerships and we work to develop the right kinds of business models, that we can get these technologies to the places where they can make a difference. In closing, I just want to acknowledge the people that did all the work that you saw, and thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions.